Hey guys, it's Dr. May. How are you today? So how my um, Radically Open DBT fans doing? Um, I hope you guys are looking forward to our lesson three today. It's actually a really good and useful lesson, so I hope you'll get a lot out of it. Um, so this one's about activating social safety, as you can see here. And explain a little more as soon as I make this big. Computer's mm, just a little bit slow. It's coming though. I can just see it. Here we go. Ah, ta -da, there we go. Okay, so activating social safety. Okay, so I hope you watch lesson two first because that's kind of the setup for this one. So in lesson two, just a very brief review, we talked about that there's five emotionally relevant Q categories we could encounter in the world, right? So the ones we're gonna focus on most today are safety cues and threatening cues right? Especially in social situations, right? So sometimes when we're around certain people, we feel very comfortable and safe, right? And we're also able to give off signals that we're socially engaged because we're feeling safe, right? Other times when we're more socially anxious or we're worried about being rejected or being criticized, we might perceive other people as being kind of like an emotional threat, right? Or even a physical threat in some cases. So we kind of approach a situation feeling threatened, okay? And this is what happens when we feel threatened as we kind of went over last time, right? So it, we kind of, it impacts our body language. And even if we want to connect, because we're socially anxious, because we're perceiving a threat, we're not able to like send off signals that we're receptive, that we're interested in connecting. We kind of like are in threat mode, right? So it's kind of opposite of the social engagement system. So we're like more constricted in our face. It's hard for us to smile in a genuine way. Our, our voice tone is more monotone, right? We kind of have a hard time making comfortable eye contact. Our gestures might be kind of tight and, you know, stiff and not so, you know, loose and friendly and stuff like that. So when we show off those signals, people might think we're not interested or we're kind of boring or cold, right? So it's gonna be hard for us to connect. But the good news is it's possible for us to purposely turn on our social engagement system so we can build the connections that we really want to make, right? And it helps us to overcome some of the social anxiety and some of those um, perceived threats that we might have, okay? So this is how it works. Whoops, sorry. Um, they're kind of opposites, right? So when one system is on, the other one's turned off. So when we're feeling unsafe and socially anxious, kind of like here, okay, our defensive threat system is on, right? Because we're perceiving a threat and our social engagement system is off, right? But when we're feeling safe, our social engagement system is on, we're looking very comfortable and receptive, and our defensive threat system is turned off, right? So it's either one or the other, okay? But luckily, um, there are things we can purposely do to turn on our social engagement system when we want to, okay? And it takes advantage of the body-mind connection, okay? So there are things we're gonna go over today that you could do on purpose with your facial expressions, with your gestures and your body that helps signal to your body and your mind and your emotions that you're safe. And then when you're doing those things, you also signal to other people that you're socially engaged and receptive to engaging with them, okay? And that facilitates better relationships, right? It makes it easier to meet people and interact and all that good stuff, okay? You, you with me? All right, I hope so. So here we go. All right, so the first set of skills, they call the big three plus one, <laughs> okay? And they actually refer to this in radically open DPT throughout the manual in different contexts because it's really just a skill you could apply to so many situations, okay? So anytime you're feeling a little uncomfortable socially, a little threatened, so to speak, you could try the big three plus one and it helps you to feel more comfortable and socially engaged, okay? So if you're sitting, you start with the plus one, okay? So the plus one is sitting back in your chair and kind of just relaxing in the chair, okay? So like those women in the picture, they look very comfortable, they're sitting back on the couch and they're kind of just chatting or whatever they're doing, okay? So it also helps to, um, you know, to kind of take your hands and maybe put them on the, you know, the armrests on the side or to keep them face up and open in your lap or just kind of loose. Okay, because if you sit back and you're all tightened up, it, it partially, you know, might get in the way of creating the social engagement feeling. Okay, another thing you could do 
um, creates a sense of calm is to take a deep breath, right? Or just in general, try to slow your breath down. Okay, so that signals to you and your brain and your body that you're feeling a little bit more relaxed and at ease, okay? Another thing they suggest is what they call the closed mouth cooperative smile. So this is um, something that you could hold for a while without it looking too fake um, or funny. Um, and you just kind of make good eye contact, relax, kind of like listen, and kind of like the guy in the picture, um, just kind of like have a nice, pleasant, closed mouth smile, okay? It's a little different from the regular ET's half smile. Um, it's a little broader than that, okay? It has a little bit more joy behind it, okay? Um, another thing they could do, you could do at the same time, and it's especially cool right now during Corona because we all have masks, right? And your eyes are the most visible part of your face. They call it eyebrow wags, okay? When I first heard this term, I was thinking like, what, like a wagging a tail, like a dog? Like, what does that mean, right? So what it means is like, ever greet somebody, right? And you see them down the hallway and it's someone you recognize and you're like, hey, how's it going? And your eyebrows pop up right? That's what they mean by an eyebrow wag. So like the woman in the picture looks like she just saw somebody that she liked. She's like, hey, how's it going? Right? Or as you make eye contact with somebody, let's say there's one person talking and there's another person in the room you're friendly with and you kind of just look over, right? That's an eyebrow wag. So it's a kind of a signal of like openness and friendliness, okay? So again, it signals to you and to them, okay? So this is the big three plus one. Not that hard, right? Think we could all handle it we just got to remember to do it okay so here's another thing we could do expansive gestures and facial expressions okay so as i mentioned earlier in the presentation with that um the diagram with the woman and the guy talking at the bar you know um when we're feeling socially anxious we tend or are threatened you know we tend to keep our gestures really small and tight and our facial expression gets a little bit more um constricted and blunted so to counter that we need to practice making more expansive gestures, okay, and facial expressions. So picture somebody that you know, maybe, or that you've seen on TV, that's kind of very lively and likes to talk with their hands and kind of be very expressive. And you could practice like channeling that inner person and trying to like use some of that in your repertoire. Um, another thing that they suggest you can do is let's say, um, maybe not in front of people, but before you have a social interaction, just like, let's say you're driving somewhere, you're gonna meet up some, with some people, practice like stretching out your face. So like scrunch it up real tight and like, you know, like stretch it out, ah, you know, like stuff like that, loosen it up, okay? You could also like kind of massage your face, like, you know, get the muscles really loose or whatever you gotta do, right? So it kind of helps to get you ready to make a more lively facial expression, okay? So kind of loosen up, all those muscles, okay? Same thing with your body, right? Shake it out, you know, loosen it up, um, stretch a little bit, okay? Um, you could even like make a game of it, practice with a kid or someone you know, like making, making up your own, you know, expressions, making up your own gestures, um, being really extra big about it, right? And you may not always use it that big in, in public in real life, but it might loosen you up enough so you make something in the middle. Okay, somewhere between like too constricted and like really crazy and wild. <laughs> okay, so, um, or pretend you're on stage, right? If you were an actor, you would exaggerate things, right? You'd make more exaggerated facial expressions, you'd use more exaggerated body language. And sometimes you gotta like overshoot a little bit before you get to that middle ground, okay? But again, signals to you and to the other person that you're feeling more comfortable and socially engaged, okay? Turns on our social safety system. Okay, they list this separately, but it's kind of was mentioned already in the big three plus one, but they call it the slow your breath skill, okay? So it's just deliberately trying to breathe a little more slowly, right? So sometimes if you're just listening to the person, like someone's talking to you and you're feeling a little anxious, just try to like slow down your breath, okay? So in addition to trying to make good eye contact, using your eyebrow wags, having your closed lips smile, you know, just kind of keep your breath nice and slow. They suggest about six breaths per minute. And um, it doesn't really sound like a lot, but it really is just like in for a count of six and out for a count of six, which isn't too bad, okay? Um, they also suggest breathing through your diaphragm or your belly because that creates a, more of a sense of calm than 
kind of more shallow chest breathing, okay? And um, lengthening your exhales in particular, because they say if your exhales are longer than your inhales, it's a sign of relaxation. Whereas if your inhales are longer than your exhales, it's a sign of being more tense. All right, so just some food for thought. Okay, here's another one. They call it in radically open DBT, the tense and relaxed skill, but it's widely publicized in other places as progressive muscle relaxation, okay? And you could do this on purpose as like a, a relaxation exercise on your own, or if you find yourself in a tense situation, you could subtly do a little bit of it while you're in the moment, okay? Um, but traditionally, um, what you would do is you would take one muscle group at a time and you tense the muscle and hold the tension and then release it and notice the relaxation. So it helps you to kind of feel the difference between feeling tense and feeling relaxed so that you could notice areas of tension in your body and then purposely start to let them go and relax, okay? So it increases your mindfulness, your awareness of what your muscles and body are doing, okay? They usually suggest to start with your feet and slowly progress up to your head, okay? Why? Because if you're already up in your head and you're having a lot of worry thoughts, the last thing you wanna focus on is your head, right? You wanna take your attention and bring it as far away from your head as you can. So that's why you would start with your feet. And it actually, on uh, some psychological level, kind of helps a little bit, okay? Um, but if you want to do it another way, not going to stop you, okay? But um, the idea is just to kind of take some of the tension out of your body, okay? All right, so next, um, using touch, deep pressure, massage, and hugs. Ooh, it sounds like a spa day, right? Um, so if you happen to have an animal, you could always relax by petting your animal. That could kind of decrease some of the tension and pressure. And if you happen to have a friend over and your animal's right there, all the better, right? Because you're doing it in the moment. Um, you can massage your face, head, and neck, all right? So just like we talked about before, it kind of may loosen some of the tension in those areas, right? And kind of feel a little less stiff. Um, using a massage machine, mm, those are pretty nice. I have a neck one myself, and it definitely helps loosen up your neck when your neck's a little tight. Um, I also have one of those that you um, kind of strap to the back of a chair and it vibrates. And that also helps like relieve some of the anxiety and tension sometimes. Um, they're not particularly expensive and they, you know, could kind of help. All right. Um, a weighted blanket could be kind of neat. Um, at first, they just used them mostly for kids with autism, but it helps with all kinds of things, including anxiety and stuff like that. So that could kind of lower some of your physical tension too. All right. They sell them in the store. It's all kinds of stuff about it online, okay? Um, they also suggest holding a hot water bottle or um, something to that effect against your stomach or your torso. Um, probably even your neck too would be nice, right? They have some of those ones that are stuffed with that crunchy stuff and you put it in the microwave for a couple minutes and it feels nice, nice and toasty, right? Um, asking for a hug or giving yourself a hug, okay? So all these things um, are, are feeling, are, create feelings of comfort. Um, they say traditionally um, physical cl closeness and touch are associated with a social safety system. Like, so in my last video, we talked about how allowing touch and touching others is associated with feeling safe with the person, right? So when you touch your, yourself, <laughs> I know that sounds funny, in some of these ways, it helps to trigger your social safety system. Now, I know some of you probably struggle with touch because of trauma issues. So just be careful using this skill that you don't, you know, use it, techniques that might trigger you. So try to do it in a way that feels safe to you, okay? So whatever that means, try to use your best judgment um, to kind of find ways to, you know, touch and create that sense of calm and safety um, in ways that are appropriate, all right, and useful. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Here's one you probably weren't expecting, using a chewing skill. Hmm. So they say that um, when you're in a parasympathetic nervous system response, that's kind of like associated with comfort and calm and safety and what they call rest and digest, okay? So you have to feel kind of rested and comfortable in order to eat, right? So when you chew, it creates that sensation of rest and digest. And so it also moves the muscle in the face associated with the social safety system. 
And believe it or not, they also say it improves memory and reduces stress. I've actually heard of um, kids with ADHD being allowed to chew gum in class because it could help with their focus. So, you know, there's something to it, right? So if you were never a gum chewer before, maybe, you know, try it out, see if it helps you, okay? Maybe makes you feel a little more safe and comfortable. Um, they also say incorporate calming foods into your everyday life. So maybe foods that are associated with feelings of comfort for you. But obviously, you know, use your judgment. I'm not saying, you know, go eat a couple tubs of ice cream every day because that's your comfort food, right? And obviously, if you have an eating disorder, um, be very careful with this skill. Um, you don't want to trigger yourself, right? It's supposed to be something that, you know, helps and creates comfort and not makes things worse, okay? Um, but, you know, normally speaking, they also say that swallowing food naturally calms the body. And maybe that's why we kind of eat as comfort too, because there's something to that. Um, but we just don't want to overdo it. Okay, so we have to use our judgment here. But in moderation, the chewing skill might be something that helps. Okay, and of course, gum has very little or no calories. So you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, weight issues necessarily with chewing gum. All right, so but watch mm, the food things, obviously. Okay. Um, using sounds and music. Um, most people that I know find music to be a coping skill, and you could obviously use it here too to create feelings of comfort and safety. So find calm, soothing music. Um, you don't own any, any, that's fine. Usually on cable, they have a channel that has like um, some kind of like new age kind of stuff that's very soothing and calm. On um, YouTube, there's plenty of stuff. Um, Inside Timer, there's a lot of stuff. So find something that feels very calming and pleasant to you, okay? They also say that a prosodic, calm human voice can be very comforting. Um, obviously a low, loud voice sounds like predatory and that's scary, or a high screechy voice could be very anxiety provoking, but you know, just a normal, calm human voice um, could be comforting. There might be a tape of somebody giving a talk um, or, or like a recording that you enjoy listening to. Um, Tara Brock has some really nice um, Dharma talks on YouTube that are very pleasant. She has a very pleasant, soothing voice. Maybe there's even some like mindfulness um, guided practices that feel very nice for you to listen to. Okay, so you could experiment and see what feels good to you. Okay, or even talking to someone on the phone that you feel very connected to could probably be soothing. Okay. Um, so they say that, um, just to get a little technical for a second, so the muscles of our inner ear that allow us to hear human speech are linked to parts of our brain that are associated with social safety. So when we hear that prosodic, calming human voice, it signals to our brain that we're safe, okay? Um, and music can also impact our brain in a lot of different ways, including our emotion processing areas, right? So that could also help with the calming, all right? So there's probably a good reason why you, you probably like listening to music, okay? All right, next, using vision, all right? So um, they suggest looking at um, pictures of people that are important to you that make you feel good, right? So just reminders of the people in your life that care, perhaps, um, or even people who have passed on that were important to you, keeping pictures of them nearby. So it could be that um, you have some digital pictures on your phone at hand that you could always look at when you want to, or even physical pictures in your wallet or somewhere um, that's easily accessible. Okay, so that's always something that can help. Um, and even looking at pictures of nature or beautiful things um, could give you a nice feeling of peace. Um, so there you go. And they also suggest while looking at them, breathing deeply, right? So whatever calming you get from the vision could be accompanied by the deep breathing and paired together for a double bonus, okay? All right. Now this one is very similar to the DBT tip skill from original DBT, okay? Um, I have a video about that if you wanna learn more. But this is, um, the T in the tip stands for tip your temperature with ice. So they suggest um, putting your face in cold water or ice water and putting your forehead and your eyes in there creates what they call a dive response. And so it slows your heart rate and helps you feel calm, right? So it creates a set of certain kind of physiology that's associated with calmness and it decreases your defensive arousal. So it decreases the activation of your threat system and it helps you feel safe and calm, okay? Um, similar with exercise, okay? So physical exercise excites the, um, I mean, activates the excitement part of your brain. So this is more like the reward center. 
Um, but that's also incompatible with the threat center, right? So stimulating the reward center could feel very good. Um, so it inhibits the defensive arousal, but in a different way, okay? And a lot of times people find that after exercising, they kind of feel like kind of relaxed and calm because they got a lot of the, a lot of the energy out. Okay, um, and finally, they suggest creating um, a personal contentment box, okay? So getting a box together where you put all kinds of stuff in there that help you create the sense of safety. So it's all in one place and it's easy to find and maybe something you keep in your apartment, your room, and you can look at it when you need to if you're feeling threatened or unsafe. And looking at the stuff in the box and interacting with it will help you get that sense of safety. All right, so this concept is very similar to what they call the coping skills box. Um, so that's like to help cope through difficult times and I have a video about that. So although this is a little different, if you wanna get ideas about how to put together a box in general, you could always check out my video about coping skills box. Okay, so hope you got some good ideas about creating social safety. And who knows, it might help you with social anxiety, with loneliness, with stuff like that. Okay, so try it out, all right? See how it goes. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Okay, bye guys.